the circular economy. Eliminate waste and pollution. Circulate products and materials. Regenerate nature. When we think about what we're doing to nature, from climate change to biodiversity loss, we often think of the impact of fossil fuels. And while a transition to alternative energy sources, such as wind and solar, is critical in bringing down our greenhouse gas emissions, it's only half the story. To complete the picture, we need to redesign the way we make and produce things, including our food, if we are to meet the targets set out in the Paris Agreement. Looking at these two farms in Kenya side by side, it's easy to see which one is thriving. Rather than bending nature to produce food, the farm on the right is a food forest, an example of regenerative food production. It uses the power of nature to grow tasty and nutritious food while regenerating nature and building healthy soils that capture and store carbon dioxide. This is Tamalu Farm in Kenya. By integrating trees and crops on one plot, the team behind this farm has increased the amount of food their land can produce and has regenerated the local ecosystem. Air and water quality has improved and biodiversity has returned. There have also been health benefits for those who work on the farm and for the communities that rely on Tamalu's produce. Tamalu Farm is not alone in trying to do things differently. Around the world, there are many examples of farmers that are making the transition to regenerative production. But it's not just farmers that are responsible for transforming the way we produce food. In the EU and UK alone, 40% of agricultural land use is influenced by the 10 largest food companies and retailers. Their sourcing decisions have a huge impact on ecosystems, and they therefore play a vital role in changing the entire food system. What ReNature is doing is working both with the suppliers, the farmers, and also with companies ranging in sizes, including companies like Nespresso. And we think about the demand power, right? And the demand pull of major food companies. How are you seeing their approaches or momentum building within the corporate space around this? We have seen a lot of uh, corporates, you know, interested in coming with offtake agreements, uh, offering prices that are over the market to buy regenerative products. Uh, and this is something that, you know, changed completely the, the scenario for the farmer, but also for um, investors that are interested, you know, in, they have the ESG now in their portfolio and they want to invest in projects that uh, has such an offtaker like uh, that offers a pretty new price. Talking about carbon, uh, you know, like we see today, the average price paid for farmers to get these carbon credits is around, you know, five to ten uh, dollars per per ton. But we we have got a pilot with Rabobank and Microsoft, so this gives farmers a lot of motivation to also say, hey, you know, we can get a, even a better price for the carbon we actually, you know, sequestering in our own farm. So why not go into that? You know, so. Better prices, not only for products, but also from the ecosystem services that they can actually benefit from. Recognizing the impact they have, big businesses have started to set climate and biodiversity targets and are taking steps to achieve them by leveraging their demand power, working with farmers and taking a systems level approach to their supply chain. Fast moving consumer goods companies and food retailers have an enormous opportunity to mainstream nature-positive food. By acting now, FMCGs and retailers can maximize benefits not only to the environment, but also to their businesses, to consumers, and to farmers. Transforming the food system will take time and investment, but there are significant benefits to be reaped by taking bold action now. So what does this look like in practice? Cerrado Mineiro, Brazil, a challenging climate in which to grow coffee due to irrigation difficulties, pests and diseases caused by degenerative farming methods. Despite these issues, 
the region is home to a number of farmers supplying coffee beans to Nestle for its Nespresso brand. In 2020, Nestle partnered with ReNature to develop and scale a regenerative agroforestry approach in Cerrado Minero that would help these farmers to transition to regenerative farming practices. Since it began, this project has converted 10 hectares of land to regenerative agroforestry. The result? Healthy soil that is now able to absorb carbon and water, increased biodiversity, and better crop security for the farmers growing the coffee. As the initiative scales, up to 850 hectares will be farmed regeneratively. Danon is working with more than 50,000 farmers across the world, from Morocco to the US, France and Romania, to help them change how they manage land and livestock to help tackle climate change and biodiversity loss. Danon recently launched a regenerative agriculture scorecard an assessment tool to help farmers holistically track whether their farming practices are good for the soil and highlight areas for improvement. But that's not the whole story. Changing how we produce food will only address part of the food system's damaging climate and biodiversity impact. To realize a truly climate and nature positive food system, we also need to think about what food we produce and that's more than just better production of current ingredients. We need to diversify and rethink food design. So where to begin? Most of the food we eat has been designed by teams of people working in food manufacturers and retailers around the world. They decide what a food product or meal should look and taste like, what nutritional value it provides, how it is packaged, and crucially, what ingredients it is made from and how they are produced. Today, just four crops, wheat, rice, corn and potatoes, provide almost 60% of the calories consumed globally. Only a few varieties of each of these staple crops are cultivated at scale, and many varieties of plants and animals are being lost. This defines not only what we eat, but the shape of the landscapes that our food comes from. It's why in every region of the world, we see fields that are home to just one type of animal or that are monocropped. Monocropping, where only one type of crop is grown on an area of land, leaves it vulnerable to pests, diseases, and climate shocks. It's why farmers use synthetic pesticides in conventional farming. To build resilience without those chemical helpers and reduce the need for other inputs like synthetic fertilizers, which impact the surrounding environment, regenerative farmers grow different types of crops and livestock on the same bit of land, just like at Tamalu. Regenerative farmers produce more types of ingredients, but each one in lower volumes. However, without sufficient demand in the market for all these ingredients, the economics for farmers everywhere to shift to regenerative production simply don't stack up. But what if companies designed products with a more diverse range of ingredients? Rather than a breakfast cereal made from the common variety of wheat, it could be made from a mix of wheat and peas that are grown together. This is called intercropping. A breakfast cereal like this, let's call it Climate Crunch, could be a supermarket staple in Europe by 2030 if businesses commit to redesigning their food products today. Well, for me, um, indigenous food crops refer to foods that are indigenous that literally grow in South Africa, have got their origin in South Africa. And I add these food crops um, to my to our, not, our everyday cooking because most of these we grew up eating and a lot of them are very nutritious, they're nutrient dense ingredients. What I do then is I'm bringing them back into the kitchens, into people's kitchens by, you know, repackaging them and reintroducing them as a chef, um, making them cool. A lot of these um, indigenous ingredients and crops are grown by subsistence farmers and small uh, rural farmers. So we actually make sure that the farmers get um, their livelihoods changed because of these ingredients. Peas are great for soil health because they fix nitrogen into the soil at much higher rates than many other cereal crops. 
and they provide nutrients for other plants that otherwise would be provided by synthetic fertilizers in conventional systems. By intercropping with another edible crop like peas, the amount of food grown on an area of land can be increased, emissions and biodiversity loss reduced, and farmer income increased and diversified. And finally, let's look beyond new ingredients and take a look at food design. What if it wasn't just the main bit of a crop that was used in food products, but other bits of the plant too? Imagine a cookie sweetened with cocoa bean shell or the pulp left over from making fruit juice, and flour made from the byproducts from making plant-based beverages. Upcycling these byproducts that we produce but don't often use, wasting far less, could create tasty new ingredients while making the most of the food we already grow and providing new revenue streams for farmers. To make products like these a reality, they need to be designed with ecosystems in mind. Zooming out from the product itself to think about how the whole system works. This is circular design for food. Farmers and companies have made a start, but there is so much more to do. It needs a change of mindset, requiring global collaboration and local participation. Rather than bending nature to produce food, food can be redesigned for nature to thrive. Food has the power to tackle climate change and biodiversity loss. We just need to harness it. The circular economy. Eliminate waste and pollution. Circulate products and materials. Regenerate nature.